Hola, comrades! Today's topic of interest, ambiguity. This might be a controversial statement, but I'm going to say it. Most people don't understand why art is how it is. I'm not saying this to be snobbish. I'm not saying you're an illiterate moron if you can't define Italian neorealism and 19th century French symbolism. The lack of understanding of what I am about to discuss has little to do with book smarts and much more to do with egotism. Consumerist culture has accustomed society to a simple but insidious relationship. The consumer pays for the right to own a certain item, and in return, that item gives them contentment. What the consumer may not understand, but the successful corporations and their marketing teams certainly do, is that the consumer's interest in an object is rooted in the object's desire to emotionally satisfy them. Even objects with ostensibly practical uses, such as sofas, are not primarily sold with a utilitarian appeal. A cheap, decades-old sofa and a pristine, beautiful velvet sofa both give you a place to sit. The difference is not only comfort, but in how owning the object makes us think about ourselves. As Don Draper says in the pilot of Mad Men, advertising is based on one thing, happiness. And you know what happiness is? Happiness is the smell of a new car. It's freedom from fear. It's the billboard on the side of a road that screams reassurance that whatever you're doing is okay. The happiness of which Draper speaks is not the profound, soul-fulfilling happiness we seek. It's the shallow, cheap happiness that we're willing to settle for because it's much easier to attain than that deeper fulfillment. No shortage of ink has been spilled about how consumerism is soulless because it provides empty calorie bliss. But less has been spoken of the emotions consumerism has destroyed in its rampage. Sorrow, regret, fear, longing, anxiety, all these emotions are essential to being honest with oneself and living a complete, balanced life as a mature adult. But these emotions are rare in consumerist culture, and because consumerist culture is so intoxicatingly circumambient, citizens are then confused when they encounter these emotions and art they pay for. It violates the law they have become accustomed to, which is that of exchanging money for pleasant feelings. And no emotion is more disquieting to consumerist culture than ambiguity. However, ambiguity is an important tool of artists because it sheds the puerile illusion that everything is either one thing or the other. Ambiguity is a major weapon of an artist who wants to challenge an audience instead of merely pleasing and satisfying them. Using it is a statement that indecision and uncertainty cannot be removed from the world without making that which is emotionally false. The gray areas may be disagreeable, but they cannot be ignored. It is a tool used to place ideas and concepts above mere plot points, upsetting the hierarchy of art as it is perceived by an audience immersed in a sea of recap culture that prioritizes the what over the why and how. Films like Inception frustrate the idea that storytelling is about X happening, then Y happening, and that causing Z to happen. For most of its runtime, Inception is dense but logical. In fact, one of the biggest flaws in that incredible film is that it is too straightforwardly logical for a film about dreams. While airier and not as well written and compelling, Satoshi Kon's Paprika, with which it shares many similarities, does a better job of capturing the wild frenzy of dreaming. But at the end of Inception, Nolan for once presents not a puzzle to be figured out, not a spectacle to unfold, but a blunt ambiguity. Is the film's happy ending a dream or not? The film cuts away before the ending can be revealed. Will the top keep spinning, meaning it's a dream, or will it fall? In 2010, which was such a terrible year for live-action summer blockbusters that people kept going back to see Inception, which made over $800 million worldwide, instead of seeing other movies, that question obsessed the cinematic zeitgeist. The same obsession with pure fact that led recappers to write synopses of the latest episodes of hit shows with the grim self-seriousness of a CBS news anchor talking about the Iraq war led them to discover that they could generate multitudes of clicks by asking what really happened on Inception. In fact, the origin of modern internet theory culture, wherein writers posit a usually far-fetched theory about a work and then attempt to justify it, can be traced to this moment. Both completely ignore the themes of the work and attempt to piece together so-called clues in what they claim to be a detective hunt, but what is in reality an attempt to justify their already held beliefs. 
These Inception articles examined the tilt of the top and looked back through the movie for evidence that what we see at the end of the film is a dream or that it is not. Meanwhile, what the film is actually saying with that scene is readily apparent. Cobb has found the inner peace he searched for, so he doesn't care whether he's dreaming. The ambiguity is the point. By the ambiguity, the pure facts are placed below the themes because the pure facts are intentionally withheld. Don't misunderstand me. I empathize with the mentality behind these articles. Ambiguity is hard. Hearing the answer doesn't matter is much less satisfying than receiving an actual answer. Honestly, I sympathize with those who debate the answer to the so-called Inception problem without even considering that the ambiguity is not a puzzle to be solved, but an answer in of itself. Consumerist society promises easy catharsis in every consumer interaction, and ambiguity is the complete opposite of that. The drive to find the answer to the Inception puzzle is the result of some people refusing to accept that there is no puzzle, and others refusing to consider that there could be no puzzle. On its surface, the Inception outrage is similar to the outrage over the ending of The Sopranos, but the latter is less endemic of a wider outrage toward ambiguity. For both, if you tell enough people the question everyone asks is not the point, the following question will eventually be raised. Then what is the point? Answering that satisfactorily about The Sopranos, while possible, requires deep contemplation about the preceding six seasons and nearly a hundred episodes of television. The best answer I have is that because Tony has missed his chance to change, whether he dies right then doesn't matter. He will forever be looking up in anxiety. He will forever be afraid that the next moment will be his last. For the most part, I'm more than content with this explanation, but I fully admit I might tweak it in the future. I hold this ending up as one of the greatest endings in any piece of art ever made. However, concerning its meaning, there's a lot to consider. A few short sentences may be adequate, but a detailed analysis would be better. The Inception ending is different because its message, Cobb has stopped worrying about whether this is reality, is straightforward. To clarify, straightforward does not equal bad or emotionally simple. This ending is beautiful and heartfelt, but it's not hard to understand. So those who don't understand its meaning are those who either actively push against ambiguity or those who don't understand its artistic use. But what about directors who make works that are more ambiguous than Nolan's? How about a director whose entire reputation is based on surrealism and ambiguity? How about a director who has used ambiguity for haunting, aching effect? How about David Lynch? Before we talk about Lynch, we should talk about the difference between ambiguity and abstraction. Ambiguity is stopping short of a definite conclusion. Abstraction is scoffing at the idea that there could be a definite conclusion. Annihilation is a perfect example of abstraction. It is a movie designed to be read emotionally and thematically, rather than literally. If you parse it literally, trying to explain the plot points with logic and reason, your reading of the work will be shallow and senseless. There are Lynch works that are more abstract than ambiguous, such as Eraserhead and the infamous eighth episode of Twin Peaks The Return, which explores the origins of series villain Bob. However, Lynch's best work tends to be with ambiguity. The two most shining examples of him as an auteur in complete command of his craft are Mulholland Drive and Twin Peaks The Return. And in both cases, he barrels toward a promised ending with speed and definite precision that a Hollywood blockbuster would kill for, and then he willingly throws that away. He refuses to indulge in easy catharsis. He refuses to provide clear answers. Well, Holland Drive's twist takes it from being a tense, sultry, surreal L.A. mystery to being one of the greatest movies of all time. The predominant theory about the film is that what happens after the twist is the real story, but I've always found that a little too simplistic. There's a lot I like about that idea, but ultimately it provides light where Lynch wanted shadow. He has famously refused to talk about what really happened, and with good reason. The ambiguity makes it far more chilling and plaintive. Ambiguity is not intrinsically good. It can be used to make vague what would have been better clearly stated, and it can also be used by hack writers as an excuse for failing to effectively convey a particular plot point or character motivation. However, the consumerist impulse toward resolution has so infested society that ambiguity is systemically viewed negatively, and that has had harmful effects on art. Ambiguity doesn't satisfy audiences, so it scares execs. Ambiguity doesn't sell merch. 
The consumerist ethos, which is to give the audience what they want, opposes the artistic ethos, which is to challenge the audience. People go to art looking for answers, and ambiguity is art responding. Yes, there may be answers, however, they're not the straightforward answers you're looking for. However, that right there is exactly why we need ambiguity. It pushes the limits of art. It implores us to ask more questions. It implores us to think more deeply about the characters we've been given and the world we've been given and what art is really capable of. Comparing these approaches, Nolan is like a math professor instructing a group of students by withholding from them the information they seek and asking them to think differently. This fits his general style as a director. Even some of his staunchest fans will admit that he cares more about grand, sweeping ideas than individual characters. His general approach to building worlds around concepts has always seemed quite stemmy to me. The ending to Inception is too acutely nestled within the character of Cobb to be neatly didactic, which is a positive, but it does have overtones of Professor Nolan saying to his class, this, not that. David Chase's approach is more harsh and pessimistic. There's the intention to evoke a disquiet, even if the audience doesn't understand that disquiet and a sizable minority despises it. The Sopranos is a series that derives much of its drama from subverting the expectations of a crime story, and what greater subversion is there than ending not with blood and gore, but with an unexpected cut to black. However, it is Lynch's approach that I find the most interesting. If Nolan is a sage professor, Lynch is a tortured poet. Inside him, he is beauty and romance so honest and heartfelt, it's tear-inducing. But it's contrasted with an overwhelming and unebbing and ancient darkness that refuses to let what is sentimental remain untouched. The central relationship at the heart of Mulholland Drive is one of the most beautiful and romantic relationships in any Lynch film. It might also be a complete lie. He, Chase, and Nolan prove there are as many ways not to provide an answer as there are to provide one. Anyway, if you liked what you saw today, consider donating to my Patreon so I can produce even more ambiguous content. Also, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. All that consumerist stuff. Adios, comrades!